Everett, my old Kentucky home. And we are so fortunate that he has come to sing to us. And would you do that now, John? And he's, he's like me. He can belt it out. So he's going to do it from the floor rather than attempt the steps. And you don't need the mic? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, my wife says I have a lot of hot air. <laughs> and uh, uh, Ms. Chrysler, God bless you and your work, and uh, the time reds. I, uh, you know, when the good Lord made man, he looked down, he surveyed the situation, and he said, whoops! I can do better than that, you made the ladies. Miss uh, Conrad is one of those ladies. She has meant a lot to the history of Boone County, Northern Kentucky, and the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I have to give credit where credit's due. If it wasn't for Reitzel and Brenda Sparks tonight, grabbing me by the collar and saying, you old country boy, come out here and listen to a little history tonight. So my wife is wondering about right now, where is he lost? <laughs> And, uh, well, I'm lost in history, and tonight I'll sing for you a song that Happy Chandler taught me back in 1968 when I was president of the student body in the UK. He put his little finger in my chest and he said, Sir, will you teach me how to sing that song? And he said, Young man, I'll teach you how to sing it, but you got to sing it from your heart. And I've never forgot that, and I've sang it in every county in the state of Kentucky many times, including the legislature. And it goes something like this. shines bright on my old Kentucky home. Tis summer, the children at play. The corn tops ripe and the meadows are in bloom. And the birds make music all the day. We no more my ladies, oh, we no more today. We will sing one song for my old Kentucky home, for my old Kentucky home far away. Now, if you would bear with me before I sing this last verse. I had a rabbit asked the other day when I sang it for their grand opening. I couldn't help but think of all the historians that have passed through Boone County, the Daniel Boones and the Simon Kentons, and the Bruce Fergusons, the Bruce Fergusons. What a man of history. What a man of history. I admired him so much, I can't believe all the work that he did in reference to history. <coughs> so many others. You are the people that keep America, America, historians, because history is the Constitution. And the attorneys that have led us, like Aza Rouse, and one where I just attended his uh, walk, uh, laying out service, will be married to Mark, Bill Robinson. And people like that, and Andy Jolly, and John Blakely, those attorneys that knew the Constitution, Sam Neese, many, many years. You know something? You don't want to forget those people. You want to recognize their history. You reach over right now and touch the pulse of the person next to you. Can you see that pulse? Can you feel it? See if you can feel that pulse of the person next to you. If he doesn't have a pulse, we're all in trouble. <laughs> and that pulse knows no ethnicity. It knows no particular faith. It knows no particular political party. It knows, but it's a gift of life from God. A precious gift of life from God. And the greatest gift that he gave us 
is the gift of love. The gift of love. When Daniel Boone came through and Simon Kenton came through, you know what book they brought with them? The Bible. The Bible. The Bible. That was what they read at Moonlight. That's what they, their foundation was. That's what prevented them from having the fear of their lives. Don't forget, how many times did Simon get to save Daniel Boone's life? Many times. And you know something? When you see that little child, reach down and touch him on the head and tell him you love him. Your mother, your father. Don't let him go by until they pass away. Go up and give him a hug and tell him you love him. Tell him you love him. Oh, the children grow on a little cabin floor, all merry, all happy and bright. By and by, hard times comes a knocking at the door. Then my old Kentucky home says good night. Now join in with me. We no more, my ladies. Oh, we no more today. We will sing one song for my old Kentucky home. For my old Kentucky home. Far away. For my old Kentucky home. Far away. God bless Kentucky. God bless America. And God bless Boone County. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much for that rendition, Tom. That was magnificent. All right, we have all been blessed. Dr. Chrysler first contacted Stephen with a request for a letter to be sent to the Domestic Geographic Names Committee of the U.S. Genealog Geological Survey in Washington, D.C. The letter was to support Dr. Chrysler's quest to have Loader Creek, which is on his farm, renamed Chrysler Creek. You will recall that Lewis Loader, author of the famed Loader Diaries, lived in Petersburg on the western shore of Boone County. The mouth of the creek on the Chrysler property is located on the northernmost portion of Boone County, some 14 miles upstream from P Petersburg. Judge Gary Moore had already crafted and sent such a letter in Dr. Chrysler's behalf, and after some due diligence calls, I too sent a similar correspondence. We have recently learned that the request has been honored and the name of the creek is now officially Chrysler Creek as it should be. <laughs> Dr. Richard C. Chrysler Jr., a philosopher, a historian, a farmer and author, and I'm sure many other career uh, items that he has not yet told me. He recently completed a book documenting the life of one of his earlier family members, Ben Johnson, son of Cave Johnson, who was the very first clerk of our county court when it became Boone County out of Campbell. And Kay Johnson was also one of our first four trustees in the county seat known then as Wilmington, now of course Burlington. And as well, he was commander of our county militia. You may not have known that our county had a militia in those days. Dr. Chrysler's presentation tonight will focus on Ben Johnson, and the house on the hill, 
which you might have known as the Kirtley home. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into the history of the Cave Johnson home at this point, but just let me briefly mention, I think everyone will understand and respect Dr. Chrysler's desire for privacy with regard to his home and farm. We don't want to just go up and knock on the door. We are just so pleased to have him here tonight and perhaps again in the future he will come back to us and tell us more of the fascinating, uh, fascinating history of the area known as North Bend in Kentucky. Please welcome Dr. Richard C. Chrysler, Jr. Benjamin Johnson was a fascinating character to me for two reasons. One, because he was the middle son of Cave Johnson, who I've done some research, and also because he was the, as I came to find out, the constructor, elder of the quote, House on the Hill, which until very recently was occupied for 40 years by Sherry and Harold Hempson. Uh, it was also before that time the house where my grandmother was born and which my great great grandfather purchased in 1867. However, <clears throat> I had found among the notes left by William Fitzgerald uh, a little slip of paper written by his wife Anne on it in, in ink saying Benjamin Johnson died on the 27th of November 1830 in Manchester, Mississippi. I thought, my golly, what was he doing in Manchester, Mississippi? I had only known him through his Boone County, what I've been able to gather from the Boone County tax rolls, the <coughs> court documents, court orders, property deeds, that sort of thing. And uh, suddenly I said, this, this is a, a great mystery. And then I had originally thought that I would just prepare a small two or three page summary of his, his history in Boone County. But uh, as it turned out, I looked around, I could find nothing on find a grave or anything else like that where he might have been buried. And I then approached, and that was a wild approach, the Ward, <coughs> the Ward family in Georgetown, Kentucky. Well, there are very few of them left in Georgetown, but there is a, an ancestral home, Ward Hall. Now, Benjamin Johnson married Holly Ward, and Holly Ward's brother, Julius, was found at Ward Hall. Her, her father, however, was a prominent man in, in Scott County, around Georgetown. And I then contacted the curator of Ward Hall. I said, look, what can I find out? And he said, there's nothing. We have family reunions every year. Nobody knows nothing. I said, I want to find out about Holly and her husband. Whatever happened to them? Because there were no graves extant, either in the Johnson, Big Johnson Cemetery in, uh, at uh, Great Crossing, which is close to, close to Georgetown, or uh, in any place. He said, but you know, there is a person out in St. Louis who makes this her hobby. Why don't you contact her? And I did, and she said, you know, it's, I've 
some of my research, I've seen the name Ben Johnson. And I said, well, he said, in, with respect to Mississippi. And I said, oh my God. And so she unfolded for me the fact that Ben Johnson's father-in-law, William Ward, had been named the Choctaw <coughs> Indian Agent for the Choctaw Indian Nation in uh, 1821 by President Monroe. So I said, that, okay. she said, and I have a, she, she was very astute and a, a, a great genealogist, and she said, and you know, I think I can find his probate. <coughs> said, it's probate? Yes, she said, well, the Mississippi Archives is very, uh, very, uh, has a great deal of material and <coughs> is very helpful. And so suddenly she unfolded to me this entire probate. Well, this probate dated from the time of his death, 19, 1830, until they finally concluded, concluded the probate in 1846. So there was a mountain of documents there uh, which told about his last years, doctor's bills, quinine, it was obvious that he had perished of uh, malaria, and he had paid all these bills up until 1830, and then at at those times, bills didn't come the next week, they came perhaps two or three months later, and uh, so his executors paid the bills, and I was able to really cover an enormous amount of material, which took me a long time to, to enter because it was all handwritten, and I wanted to put it on a computer, and uh, so I could analyze it. And then I finally said, "Well, you know, there was nothing in there. All she had was a tax roll." for Yazoo County, or Hines County, then Yazoo County, which showed that Benjamin Johnson and William Ward, his father-in-law, were together in certain, certain businesses in the early 1820s. Now, the tax rolls in Louisiana are not like they are in Kentucky. They don't show property, personal property, or real property. So you don't find out how many cows you have, and you don't, how, how much land you have on, on Powder Creek or on the Ohio River or on Wilkes or whatever. What you do find out is the number of slaves you have. They counted the slaves and the income from business dealings. So if you got income from just selling your cow or doing whatever, selling your wheat or your hay, it was not recorded. Uh, so there was a great Gap there because he was down there. We saw from the tax rolls, he was down there in 1822 and he died in 1820, uh, 1830. So here is eight years of, with really very little to go on. And so I said, Well, look, the only way to do this is to go through the property deeds and the court orders <coughs> and, and see if we can dig up, dig up something. Well, that was two years ago. I'm not, I would have to have had to get on a plane, either drive to Yazoo County, Mississippi from Boone County, which I was not able to do, or get on a plane and fly to Jackson, rent a car, go up to and spend four or five days in Yazoo City looking at the, at the clerk's office, at the property need records in the clerk's office. Well, I couldn't do that either. And I finally, as this, this woman out in, in, in uh, Lady Ellen, St. Louis said, look, I think I've seen on their website, way back, way, 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 way down, a list of the genealogists in Mississippi. So I, it took me a while, but I found the list and went through it and picked up about four or five names. None of them, most of them, only one, none of them were interested in doing any research for me in the Yazoo County clerk's office, clerk's office. <coughs> except for one. And she said, I'm too far away, but I have a friend 
who's in Oxford, and she goes down there a lot. <clears throat> well, I found that, and she developed for me another enormous amount of material, and really outlined what he did. And in the in those intervening years, which was mainly to acquire uh, through the good good offices of his father-in-law, uh, young uh, Choctaw tribal properties, and he became a land speculator. Uh, he also bought himself a, a cotton plantation, and uh, but more, most importantly, he and his brother-in-law, who is also his father-in-law's son-in-law, together bought a piece of property, again at the father's guidance, on the Yazoo River, in a big bend in the Yazoo River, with a bluff above it, sort of looking down on it, called Hannon's Bluff. Well, they bought this, and at a reasonable price, a very reasonable price, but they didn't know what to do with it. It was a big piece of property. So the father-in-law said, awesome, look out. I have some friends in Jackson who are well-placed, or good businessmen, men with a good reputation, and they will help you sell this. So they, conform, they formed a consortium, and they had, from, from, from 1830 to 1834, they sold property lots there on this and it's what they called the town at that time Manchester uh, the subsequently the town was so well located on the Yalta River which at that time was much bigger than it is now and it flowed right into the Mississippi so that the, there was there was very little land traffic that's what was around here and they were able to blossom and so the, the, the state and the, and the state said, listen, the, the county seat is in Benton, which is a little nothing of a town, and here we have this big lots of place. So we will make Manchester, Yazoo City, and the county seat. Well, if I could read what it was, on those four sales, or no, there were about five sales, from 1930 to, uh, to 1830, or 1830, 1834, resulted in the equivalent of, of $1,140,436 in today's terms. And Ben's share was half of that. So he was around $570,000, which is a lot of dough. And then, his, when he was his probate of his estates in Boone County and in Yalta County amounted to the equivalent of $574,000. That is, he left his heirs because he was dead. Uh, the equivalent of $1,444,200. And uh, this is was for a fellow from fairly, from very modest beginnings, quite an accomplishment. And uh, therefore, I named the book that Mrs. Conrad referred to, Boone Boy Makes Good. And he did, he made it very good. And I, if I had my lesson, I could read you the last paragraph. But it says, Indeed, Ben Johnson was an extraordinary man, one of whom Boone County should be most proud, a captain in the U.S. Army at 29, the Boone County representative to the state legislature in Frankfurt at 29, oh, no, 24, he was the captain at 24, 29, a director of the Bank of Burlington at 31, builder of a fine brick state on the Ohio River, and we will come to that. 32, and one who amassed a enormous personal fortune, and most importantly, of course, at 39, the one who purchased the land which was to become Manchester, Mississippi. 
uh, the present county, county seat of uh, Yazoo County. Uh, there was one, before we get to the dessert, there was one uh, thing which continued, one big question, where was he buried? As I said, he wasn't in, in the room, find a grave or any of this other stuff. And this yeah, well, lady that, who, in, who in Oxford was a, went way beyond my ability to research and found a grave on a portion of his property which was called uh, of, of, of another family entirely, but they had purchased the land, and on the land was the gravestones, and clearly marked, of his father-in-law, William Ward, Ward Hall, Georgetown, and his son, William Ward Jr., one of Ben Johnson's granddaughters, because his son was in the in, in, in the area, and uh, an unmarked stone, a uh, really worn stone, right in the middle of them, which was obviously Ben Jones' thing. And to me, this was the Holy Grail. I was just threat. then I could write my book. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think I'm not sure I missed anything, but I well, he was a. There's one other thing. In trying to find out where he was buried in the early stages, I went through all these uh, files of old newspapers that you could find on the thing. I finally found this one thing, and it was in the Rhode Island American, which was published in Providence, Rhode Island, on January 7th, 1831. It said, in Manchester, Mississippi, Captain Benjamin Johnson, aged 33, of course he was 41, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> he was third in command under the gallant Krogan in the defense of Fort Sandusky against the inhuman Proctor. Well, Fort Sandusky was a, uh, a great battle in the, uh, in the War of 1812 occurred in 1813, uh, Proctor was a highly, no, Krogan, Krogan was highly awarded, given a, a, a big uh, award by the president and promoted to something like general. And so he, he rewarded his 23-year-old third command, Ben Johnson, he, he promoted him to captain. Well, as captain, of course, he comes back home and won't be the big deal. And he goes down to Georgetown to visit his brother. And that's where his uncle, Robert Johnson, is. And Robert Johnson was Keith Johnson's older brother. Robert Johnson introduces him to his granddaughter, Polly, Polly Ward. And that's how it all started. Anyway. It was a wonderful odyssey, and I, it, it, it took me a year and a half, but it, it, was, it was fun. It was, it, it was very interesting. And so <coughs> it just shows you which, what things you could oh, dig up, and you, just, you don't even know that they're there, and, and suddenly, bang, it happens. Okay, all right. House on the Hill. Now, this picture is something which was up at the top is a dark uh, thing got the Cave Johnson house. But down below it is a, is a, is a rectangular, is a rectangle, which was the, was to be the original spot of Bulletsburg in um, 1796, the October term of the uh, Campbell County Court authorized Cave Johnson to develop a town called Ellisburg. And indeed, he had a plot of the town, you know, with all 
uh, divided into the town lots. And documents up until oh, about 19, 1810 referred to roads which led from Bulletsburg to, to this and that, although Bulletsburg never existed. In, uh, in 1818, Ben Johnson went to, must have gone to his father and said, I, listen, I'm, I'm back here, I have, I'm living in Burlington, I have some farmland and gunpowder and some in whoopers and uh, uh, I'd like to build a place down here. So indeed, Ben Johnson allowed him to build his house on the river that 210 acre plot of ground. Now, he did build it, and Ben Johnson never sold the, the property. I mean, Cape Johnson never, but he could, he could use it as long as he paid the property taxes. And the tax rolls for Wood County will show that as of 1818, Ben Johnson was paying taxes on 210 acres on the Ohio. And he built a house there, a very fine brick house, a house very similar to his father's. That's what he knew. Larger windows, much larger windows than his father's, and a circular staircase, which was really very nice. Uh, unfortunately, and that's where he moved with his wife, Polly. That's where he had his first child. Uh, 1820, Eliza, and then in 1825, with the first recorded flood I found for Boone County, and it, the house is on lower ground. It's really actually floodplain, that's what we see now. And so the flood came out and filled out the basement <coughs> and part of the first floor. And of course, floods recede, and you have to clean up the carpets and wash everything, get the mud out and all this. But that apparently was enough for Polly. And she was used to a very fancy life in Scott County and Georgetown and, you know, living up here. The Wood County was a little, a little primitive to her at that point. And uh, so she said, listen, we have to have something else. And so again, he chose Here, it's the, right there, that is it, right in there, right in there. Uh, he, he started to, to build a house. The house was uh, he started to build the house. He had a, 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 a we'll, we'll see. He had a, Put that on there. This is the wrong way around, and so that's upside down. But you can see that little beehive thing over there. That was the house he lived in, the one that flooded. And subsequently, this house over here was the one he started to build. That was the house on the hill. This house was. Uh, the, the history is that, okay, he died in 1830 before the house was completed. His wife, Polly, had no reason or desire to stay up in Boone County. So she went back to Scott County, to Georgetown. Now, it took time for the commissioners to, to resolve the probate and everything else like that. And when Uh, the Cape Johnson house is over here. Cape Johnson had been relying on his on, on Ben to uh, to act, act as security for a big loan he had uh, made, he had gotten from the Bank of the United States. Uh, he had fallen into financial difficulties because of a, of a depression in 1819. All the corn prices banked actually throughout the country, but were severely hurt, and many farmers went out of business completely, and 
very <coughs> damaged very severely. Uh, so he borrowed some money uh, and mortgaged his house, his place. Well, he couldn't keep up, and after Ben died, there was no one else to step for security. So before the Bank of the, of the United States took over, closed on the mortgage, Ben's widow, Polly, bought the Cave Johnson estate. With it, she also bought the house right up there that Ben had started, and which wasn't on his land, it was still on Cave Johnson's land, but once she bought it, it was on her land, and then she subsequently sold the entire property, she was in Georgetown, to a, a fellow named George Balsey. Now, Balsey, that was in, in 1836, or 1838, and Balsey moved in the, that house, which had been cleaned up, and nobody knew there had been a flood, until uh, there was a flood in, 40, in 48, he died, and so his, his wife, just like Ali, said, come on, let's, let's do something. So they finished the house on the hill, and maybe we can show some pictures of it. Um, well, they, they put a front porch on it. It didn't have a front porch. Our place, the Cave Jones house, didn't have a front porch either until about 35, when my grandfather put the portraits on the front and the back of the veranda on the front facing the river and a little entrance porch on the front. Otherwise, normally you just walked out the door and you touched and the grass. Well, there was a little, there was a little concrete or, or a stone slab that you stepped onto and then onto the grass. But there was nothing like this. This was added in about 1848. see there are the big windows. This is a picture that the Hamsleys took when they moved in there, or didn't move in right away, but when they got in back. And, oh, okay, good. Now, you can see there are three sections, one, two, and three. Now, what Balsey did was he added the middle section. There was empty space between the main block and the outside kitchen. And so he added a uh, space there which became a kitchen and, as you'll see that little window up there, a sleeping area. Because above there where those large windows are, on the far side, was like a barn. There was, rafters were there, you could see the daylight practically. And uh, there was nothing on the walls. It was completely unfinished, and he didn't finish it. He, when he did put on that little addition there, which closed them too. Now, Balsey put on that, and one more picture maybe, if we can get, okay, good. This is the back. You see again the three sections. The first one, the next one, and the lower one. Now, he also added a summer kitchen here on the right hand side, that little part was, was the outside kitchen was fed uh, up This summer kitchen allowed them to get away from the heat of the, the main kitchen. And so it was added. These pictures were taken in 1973 by Jerry and Harold Hemsley. Uh, but they house for 125 years hadn't changed. From 48 to 73, it hadn't changed a bit. And my grandmother was born there, my great-grandfather was lived there, my great-grandmother and her father and her husband, my grandmother and my, her brother were born there. Uh, it was fairly primitive. And in 19, as I said, 1973, when the hemp leaks, uh, my grandmother sold the place in, right after the war to uh, Harold's grandfather. And 
Then they took it over and they did a magnificent job for restoring it. At that time, 1973, there was no heat in the house. There were two working fireplaces. There was no electricity, no kerosene lamps and candles. And worst of all, there was no water, no plumbing. All your water had to be brought in from the outside. That in 1973. So, and they turned it into a south here to a silk purse. Beautiful. And so uh, it was. It was a modern home. It was a normal, really very fine modern home. And uh, I was fortunate when they decided to move. I was fortunate enough to be able to get a hold of it and um, added a few things, but nothing uh, really. You can show it. You, but this, that, that's how the house looked. The front looked when uh, Ben Johnson had it. The porch was added by Ballsy later. <coughs> Shawnee for Shawnee for Bend of the River. 
So Anita must have some sort of an Indian uh, relevance. I, I had no idea. And then suddenly I found one envelope. When we moved back, we got the space back in uh, 2000, there were 1,100 letters. 1,100. And 1,100 letters. And a number of them had Juanita on them. And one of them had W E dash N E E dash A. We need A. So it wasn't an Indian name at all. It was simply We need a We need a post office. As I said, he was a pretty funny fellow. There were joke, the uh, Boone County reporter used to make jokes about it continually. And, uh, and he was <laughs> buddy, buddy Crippen, Buddy Cropper, I mean. Yeah. Anyway, that is the conclusion of my presentation, and I, if, I would be happy to answer any questions this whole night now. Mm. There are no questions. What year was the house? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, there's some pictures of the house <coughs> on, the, on the hill. These were taken recently. These were taken recently. And a, a portico with that. And, no, I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah. yeah. We'll, we will see the portico. <coughs> and this, this is the drive of the Iowa River is back that way. And that's the western side of the house of the Iowa River. That's the, a week, that, that's the way the house looked when. Um, when I when I got it. those little cornices up there were added because at times when the Hamptons were putting it in, you couldn't get glass that big, so they had to have a cover of some sort. Now they, they, I found they, now they make that that glass that size, so it's a different place. But there it is again from the other side. You can see and you can see that little doorway. The end there. That's where we need a post office. <laughs> there's, there's, that's the portico. That's the portico which existed beforehand. And that's another where we're taking it down. And there are the beginning of the, uh, the beginning of the portico. Existed. And there is the finished portico. That's up there now. That was a little bit of a unification. The inside, you can see how spacious those rooms are. They're really enormously, well, you don't see them, but there are doors which are eight by four feet, eight feet by four feet, two of them, and you swing in or three, you separate. And the house is unique and been proclaimed unique by a number of Cincinnati uh, architectural historians because you enter. And instead of going down the street, corridor with the rooms of left, a bit right, rooms of left, you enter and you enter a, a, a big central foyer. And off to the this side of the foyer is the little room. Off to that side of the foyer is the post office. Then you go back through the, the central rooms. And they were divided by these doors, which you can see the doorway there anyway. The doors are double. <coughs> And this whole architectural layout exists only three times in Kentucky. And two of those times are in Lexington. One is the Hunt Morgan House, which is a, a, a fairly uh, popular or renowned house. In other words, what happened was that the man who designed Hunt Morgan, or one of these people, came up to here, and because Holly was from that area, came up and designed this house, because it's very much unlike the other two, that where I live, the one he designed, or Ben designed. One other thing, in front of the house is a tree which is 165 years old, and it is supposed to last for another, I don't know, 
800 years or something like that. A ginkgo tree from, from China. And Henry Clay, when he came back from China, bought 24 ginkgos. He, 12 he left around Lexington, where he was from, and 12 he spread out. This is, this is the story around the state. And one of them, because he was a, he and Holly, he was a, they were relatives, he came up and planted this geco tree with, as Ben was building this house. And it's a magnificent tree. Uh, Geckos have this extraordinary characteristic. They turn bright yellow in the fall. Then something overnight, all the leaves fall, just all at one time. So you have a yellow carpet around the tree. Extraordinary. Well, I, I, I guess. Yeah, that, there's a picture of what is now the dining room, and you can see that these windows were still extant, they weren't broken. But you can see how, how windows out the house. And that is a, a little doorway which leads out to a porch. At the barn before, the barn after. <laughs> the signs are any different. There's another picture of the house. We see the photo. There's another picture of the house. It's a tree in any picture. Is that tree you were talking about? Oh, yeah. The, 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 the tree right here is the ginkgo with the bright green leaves. I think I'm right, aren't I sure? Yeah, it's a, it's a one on the right side. So that's it, gentlemen. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Dr. Chrysler. It was fascinating, and um, we hope that sometime in the future you'll come back and give us some more history of the North Bend area. So, uh, there being no further business to come before this body, we shall adjourn and see you in a couple of months. In fact, in July, Carl Litzenmeyer and Peggy, his wife, will be presenting Stephen Foster songs for us down in the, uh, the lower level of the uh, library where the big square piano is, that ancient instrument that they recently donated to the library. So we do hope you'll come back and enjoy that evening with us and we'll have refreshments. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, John, for singing to us. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.